This brings us to, to the, today's forum's keynote speaker, Professor Graham McGregor. Now, Graham is Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Wolfson Institute of Preventive Medicine, Queen Mary University of London, and Honorary Consultant Physician at Barts and the London Hospital, and also a visiting professor at St George's Hospital Medical School, London. Following his training as a nephrologist, Graham became interested in blood pressure control mechanisms, particularly related to the renin-angiotensin system, the mechanisms through which salt actually elevates blood pressure. He's published more than 400 scientific articles on various aspects of blood pressure and cardiovascular medicine. In 1996, he set up an action group on salt, the Consensus Action on Salt and Health, CASH, to try to get the food industry to add less salt to food and thereby get a reduction in salt intake. Now, this was, in fact, very successful and resulted in the Food Standards Agency taking, taking on the task of salt reduction. The UK is now actually leading the world in salt reduction. Graham later went on to set up WASH, World Action on Salt and Health, uh, Blood Pressure UK, and most recently, Action on Sugar an action group which aims to reduce added sugar in foods and soft drinks in the same way has been done so successfully with salt. So please join me in welcoming Professor Graham McGregor. Uh, well, Chairman, Chairman or Chairwoman, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure uh, to talk to you and, and particularly to thank Rosemary for inviting me and the AHPC uh, to give this. I mean, I want to say, first of all, I start, that I think Australia has done a great job on tobacco. You've, you've led the world in tobacco control and particularly with, now with plain packaging and the UK has copied that, hopefully, although they keep jumping in and out. Um, and what I'm going to say today is really I want to see Australia taking more action and I can see that you've now got the sort of agenda there that the HPC has pulled together. The question now is what actions are you going to actually do because you can't do everything. You've got to focus on one or two things that are key and are, don't cost a lot of money because every country in the world is short of money and the governments are not going to provide it so you have to be realistic. Uh, so with that to do, I'll then talk about what we've managed to do in the UK uh, and how I think it could be done quite simply in Australia. And I need to remember my colleague Bruce Neal, who's done a very good job on calling attention to salt reduction and the importance of it in Australia, but has yet to see action. And I think this is the start of the day when we want to get action, and it comes from you. Thank you. Um, uh, and you have to take that action. There's nothing I can do, but I'll try and persuade you that it's worth doing. So this is my title. Unhealthy food is the biggest cause of death in, the, in the Australia and the UK and in the world. Now, why do I say that? Oh, sorry. And this is from the Global Burden of Disease Study. You may be aware that this large group of people uh, working in collaboration with the WHO and funded by Bill Gates and others, looking at the major factors that cause death, disability, dallies, or whatever you like. They look at all of them. Uh, and this just shows you here the major causes of death in the world. And you'll see that... Uh, how do I do this? Ah, no, sorry. quite difficult to see. Unhealthy diet is by far the biggest cause of death, followed by blood pressure, followed by tobacco, air pollution, uh, obesity, diabetes, alcohol, to cholesterol, low physical activity, low GFR, and then a whole lot of others here. So you can see straight away what are the major causes, and then there is a table for the UK, Australia, exactly the same, and th these vary a bit from country to country. But again, unhealthy diet and tobacco are by far the biggest causes of death and disability and far the biggest preventable disease that we face. So, you know, for anyone looking at this from a public health perspective, obviously one is going to tackle tobacco, and I'm not going to talk about that, an unhealthy diet. And anything else, 
is important. I mean, there are lots of other things you could do, but when you think about them, they're quite difficult to do and cost a lot of money. So the priority to me is to take action that can be done simply and doesn't cost money. Oh, sorry, I'm putting on. And this is going now, I'm going to focus now on food. I'm not saying that's the only thing we should be doing, but it's the primary thing in my view, apart from tobacco. And the reason is this, that that processed foods and soft drinks are full of salt that put up our blood pressure, and I'll talk about that, and that is the major cause of heart attacks, strokes, and heart failure. It's full of fat, and saturated fat puts up a cholesterol. In spite of, I don't know, we've had some publicity about this in Australia, had some in the UK. There's no doubt that saturated fat puts up cholesterol, which is a major cause of atheroma, as I'll come on to say, and a major cause of heart attacks and strokes. And then, of course, there's then got fat and sugar, which are very calorie dense in these processed foods and soft drinks. And this puts up our calorie intake and causes obesity, type 2 diabetes, and of course cancer is associated now with cancer of the stomach, with salt, also with fat, and also with obesity. So it's becoming clear now that cancer is also a disease that we can prevent, particularly from tobacco, obviously as we already know, but also through diet. And then of course sugar has the unique ability of causing dental caries, and I'm not going to talk about that, but just to say that you'll be aware in Australia, as in the UK, the commonest cause of anaesthetics and admission for children to hospital is tooth decay. The commonest cause of severe pain in children is tooth decay, and we all develop tooth decay, and if we didn't eat sugar, we could get rid of it. A nice anecdote there is Queen Elizabeth was the only, the first, not the second, was the first queen in England or royalty who could afford sugar and she ate vast amounts of it and was d addicted to it and she had black teeth and that's why she never got married. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the individual ones. What about blood pressure? Well, as you should all know, blood pressure is, is throughout the range Oh, sorry. It's very, very difficult to see these buttons. Um, you can see here that the risk of blood pressure goes down to a systolic of 115. Now, this is very important because if you think, if you think we don't actually define clinical high blood pressure to 140, right, it's here. And yet, look at the risk going right down. This is more than 80% of adults are at risk from their blood pressure. And exactly the same applies to cholesterol. And when you get patients say, oh, the, my, or of individuals say, oh, my doctor said my blood pressure's normal. And you say, well, what level is it? Oh, it's normal. Well, wait a minute. If it's 125, you're at much greater risk than if it's 115. And actually, the number of deaths attributed to blood pressure that occur here are the same as here because the, although the risk is less here than here, the numbers are much greater. So you get roughly equal numbers of deaths due to blood pressure within the normal range or so-called normal range, it's the usual range, uh, as you do uh, and the same for heart attacks. So it's important, when you think of a strategy, okay, very important to treat blood pressure, seek these people out and very effective. But we should be thinking about population strategies to reduce the whole blood pressure. And of course, those population strategies don't necessarily cost any money. And that's very attractive. Now, what is, how does blood pressure kill you? Well, firstly, by the direct effects, it's bursting your brain here, the cerebral hemorrhage. And you see the thing that actually kills you is the, the pressure because the brain is being pushed down into a box and that the brainstem compression is what kills you. But actually, lacuna strokes, which are uh, damaged directly due to the pressure in the brain cell, are a much more common cause of strokes, directly due to pressure. And the pressure also causes heart failure, because the heart's having to pump against greater pressure, uh, aortic aneurysms, and kidney disease. So that's a major cause. Remember, blood pressure is the biggest cause of death in the world. But what's the other cause? Well, the thing is that blood pressure accelerates atheroma. We're all developing atheroma, and hopefully our arteries don't look quite as bad as this one. This is a carotid artery that's been split open, and you can see here the plaque, and this is what we all have, 
are these deposits of cholesterol with a fibrous cap. You need a certain level of fat intake to give you a cholesterol that actually causes this, and some communities used to be protected from it because they didn't eat any fat, so cholesterol was too low, but that's now almost in, uh, uh, so rare because everyone eats fat. But that doesn't cause a lot of problems because you need to obstruct the artery by 70% to cause a reduction in flow. What causes the problem is the cap the fibrous cap becomes destabilized and may shear off. Here's an ulcerated plaque, attracts platelets and red cells, sort of healing process. But of course the difference here is blood is pumping by at 70 times a minute. You can feel your carotid artery you want and think, you know, what's going on there? If you've got one of these, little bits of clots fly up into the brain and cause dementia in the heart, damage to heart muscle and the kidney. Kidneys a major cause of uh, dementia, heart failure, kidney disease. But the thing that terminates you, which you all know, is here. This is where the plaque has um, ruptured and uh, has fissured, I mean, and a clot comes out and blocks the artery. This has blocked the uh, internal cerebral artery and, of course, causes a massive thrombosis. But this is what happens with a coronary thrombosis, a heart attack. You actually block the artery, causes lack of blood beyond it, and the, the bit of heart muscle dies, and you either die or recover, and, and so on. So you can see how important this process is. Now, blood pressure accelerates the rate of formation of atheroma, as does cigarette smoking. So you've got three major factors. You've got cholesterol, necessary to have, level will also determine it, level of blood pressure and smoking. And then, of course, the main factor that destabilizes the plaque that leads to these terminating events is blood pressure. And if you think about it, if you've got a plaque here in the carotid artery and it's going like this, it's much more likely to crack open than if it's going like this. And blood pressure is one of the major factors. So lowering it will prevent this. Now, what puts up blood pressure? You see why it's such a big cause of death? Well, salt intake is by far the most important. Potassium being obese, lack of exercise, and alcohol, fortunately only in excess, uh, puts up uh, blood pressure. But salt's by far the most important. I'm not going to talk about all the evidence. We can talk about it later if you want, but the evidence is overwhelming. It's as strong as tobacco. That isn't to say there aren't a few people around saying it's not good as always and so on, but they're, they're talking rubbish in my view. and We can discuss why, but I'm not going to go into the detail into that right now. And blood pressure is no doubt it's responsible. Salt puts up blood pressure, responsible population blood pressure, rise in blood pressure with age and high blood pressure. And Salt also has other effects. It's a direct cause of stomach cancer, which is not a major cause of death in Australia, the UK, but in uh, China, Korea, and Japan it is. And of course, it's also associated with kidney disease directly and bone denarization, osteoporosis. Salt pulls out calcium in the urine and is the main factor causing a negative calcium balance. If you eat a high salt diet, you'll be in negative calcium balance. You gradually leach out calcium from your bone, much more likely to get osteoporosis. And every government and every medical organization has recommended a reduction. The actual target is, is varies depending on country to country. The WHO recommendation is five grams. And if we look worldwide, salt intakes roughly nine to 15 grams, the recommendation to go down to five. That is, that target's not a final one. It's just pulled out of the air. And lower salt intakes would be, be even more beneficial, but are not very practical currently. So the big question is not what we should do, what we, whether we should do something about salt. The question is, how do we tackle it? That's the point. And that's the same for obesity, and uh, I'll come on to. Now, obviously, you're not to measure the amount, sources of salt. And the real question here is, where does the salt come from in a country? Is it mainly added by the food industry? Is it added by the consumer? And obviously, that will vary from each country to another. And in Australia and the UK, but the bulk of the salt comes from food industry in processed and when we eat out. We have no control over it, right? If it's added at the cooking table, then obviously you need a public health campaign to get people to realize that salt is toxic, it gradually poisons you, and is gradually going to kill you, and you need to 
reduce it, and that's the thing. Salt is a chronic, long-term poison that is one of the biggest causes of death in the world. That's the message, and that's the correct message, right? Salt is a chronic, long-term poison. Just think about that when you have your next meal. And this... So... I'm going to focus on salt added by the food industry because that is by far the most important part of it. Around 80% of the salt you eat in Australia is added by the food industry in some way, and very little is added in the cooking or at the table relatively, about 15%. So this is by far the most important, and by far the most important way to do that is to get the food industry to slowly reduce it, and I'll come on to. And this is the most effective. We could label foods properly, and we do have systems in the UK, and you have some systems in Australia now, but they're somewhat confused. I mean, being to a supermarket yesterday, I'm somewhat jet-lagged state, but it seemed to me you still had sodium labels, which are, I mean, God only knows what sodium is, Um, some metal, metallic iron that melts when you add water, I remember from school. And public education, Uh, these are not effective, frankly. Uh, They're very costly and don't have much effect. We could have specific lower salt foods. These are not effective and are just a sop by the food industry to try and do something. We could avoid processed foods and eating out. And that's all right for people with high blood pressure, but it's not very practical for the whole population to not eat processed foods and not go out. I mean, come on, you know, you've got to be realistic. People want to go into a supermarket, take food off the shelf, put it in a microwave, and eat it five minutes later. And it's all real objecting to that, but that's modern life. You've got, you can't do things. You have a tax on salt. That doesn't seem to have been very popular, and I'll come back to that with a tax on sugar a a bit later on. Now, who's responsible? Well, of course, the food industry, you you have a choice. You see, the food industry give you a choice, uh, and therefore uh, you can decide whether you want to eat their products or not, Um, and you can cook your own food at home, and you don't need to buy all these ready-prepared products or fast foods, and you don't need to add any salt, so that's fine, so they get out of it. But it's a load of rubbish, in fact, because they spend billions pushing this stuff down our mouth by advertising it in very enticing ways ways, particularly to children and to more socially deprived people who can't resist the advertising. So the food industry is responsible, right? And they need, they're slowly killing us. Global companies like Nestle, Unilever, uh, Kraft and so on are slowly killing us, not just from the salt, but also other things in the foods. And the supermarkets are, and you need to get that message across that you are slowly killing us, right? And we want you to stop doing it. Because unlike the tobacco industry, which until recently didn't have an alternative, there is an alternative. They can make healthy food. They don't need to make... They can make healthy foods. They can have healthy ready meals. You don't need to have all this salt, saturated fat and sugar in it. So they, they have no excuse. And, of course, then the government is blamed. Somebody blamed the government for everything. I mean, it's all very well, but, you know, politicians are pretty ineffectual individuals. Civil servants are hopeless at organising something. But they do have a role here, and that is in organising the food industry to give a level playing field. That is to make sure that any reduction that occurs is done properly across all sectors, properly enforced. And that, I think, again, it's not for me to comment specifically on Australia, but is a problem with your uh, federal and provincial or state governments as who exactly is responsible. But I think the cigarettes is an interesting parallel because obviously that presumably was done at a national level and these food policies need to be done at a national level too. Now, in order to get the food industry and the government and politicians to move, you've got to have huge publicity. And it's got to be really well focused on exactly that, that the food industry is poisoning us and it's time the government did something. And this is what we did initially with salt, was to demonize it. We've done the same as sugar, that salt's killing us. Why isn't the food industry doing something and the government needs to organize it? And that was very successful after we'd learned how to do it. It took us a few years to learn how to do it. And, you know, again, going on, it it almost gets boring, particularly with sugar now, because it's so easy to do that everyone is interested in sugar, where salt is more difficult, more of a challenge to get across to the media. 
And of course, Jamie, we use Jamie Oliver, he, he had a huge amount of salt in his balls, I mean his uh, meatballs, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they were actually, to be interesting, they were spaghetti uh, tomato meatballs that had twice the concentration of seawater, which is quite a good thing to use. If you look at your, the sodium, or it labels seawater as one gram of sodium per 100 grams. So you can compare it, very good for patients with high blood pressure to get the feeling of how huge the amounts of salt are. Kellogg's cornflakes, for instance, had 1.1 grams of sodium when we started in the UK. That's 10% more salty than salt seawater and they didn't like it when they said it was solid seawater for breakfast and again using these sort of phrases is very important don't you know don't hold back and you're very good in Australia at being outspoken and that's what you need to be and now they're around 50% uh, seawater so there's been a huge reduction they're still the most salty cereal in the UK this was the plan. Salt intake was roughly 10 grams, a bit less than that. And the target was to get it to six, but if we're looking at the WHO type, five grams. So that means that the, if you work it out, and again, you've got to work out what all this means in terms of policy. A lot of, a lot of public health people just say, oh, we're going to reduce salt. Well, wait a minute, what are you actually talking about? How much are you going to reduce it by? Is that practical for the industry? What this means is that to get it to this target, the the industry's got to do more than a 50% reduction in the amount of salt they currently put into products. And that will, in some products you may not be able to reduce, some meat products you get to a level where you, it's used as a preservative, is the only role that salt is used as a preservative, nowhere else. Um, and even then it's controversial. But you may not be able to get the 50% reduction. So you'll then again have to make even bigger reductions. So you've got to work out, same with obesity and type 2 diabetes, what is it actually trying to do? How much calories will it take out of the system? And this was the, that was the target then, 50% reduction roughly. And the only, they have to take it out, right? And the public can use less, but it has very little effect. And the only concession was that you can do it slowly. Because you take it out too quickly, people will notice and this, just to, this is a different way of looking at public health. It's not telling the consumer to do something, which is what we love to do, shout at the consumer, blame it all on them. It's shouting at the food industry who are responsible, just like the tobacco industry, and getting them to slowly take it out, right? It's fantastic for public health because you get a reduction, if you're talking about sugar and fat as well, you get a reduction in blood pressure, obesity, and cholesterol. You're not changing the diet, Right, So you're not asking people to change what they eat. They go on eating the same old rubbish, much as we'd prefer to change that, but it's not realistic, and it doesn't cost anything. That's incredibly attractive to a government, right? Only costs a very small amount of money. I'll show you how much it costs in the UK. The food industry bear the cost. They don't lose any sales because people go on buying the same foods, whereas a tax or restriction on advertising obviously causes a loss in sales, so they don't like that. So if you can get them in the right frame of mind and they w really realize they're gonna have to do something and they're gonna get taxed out of existence or uh, advertising is gonna be stopped, which again are all things we advocate, then they'll start doing this. Uh, very pleased to do it, thank you very much. So what we did in the UK uh, was, unfortunately, we, as someone mentioned, we were able to use the food standards that had just been set up, although sadly that's been dissolved now because of a right-wing government. Um, progressive salt targets. So what you do is you take every s category of food, 86 categories in the UK. Now, I think in the U US they've just set 160 categories. Um, that you set a target for each group. Let's take bread. You'd say, look at the bread, how much salt's in the bread, which is the biggest source of salt intake in the UK and Australia, and set a target for four years ahead for the food issue. It's not a very big reduction, to say 15 to 20% reduction, and that's agreed maximum and average targets that usually sales weighted. I won't go into the actual details, they're rather tedious. And having done that, you then, two years later, look how they're getting on, then reset the target for two years later with an even bigger reduction, you see. But it's only every time you confront them, it's a small reduction. 
So it doesn't look very big, but we've now done that three times in the UK, and over that time, it means the products have come down by about 30 to 40 percent in the amount of salt that's being added. So you get quite big reductions over a 10-year period, and uh, that has worked reasonably well, although we have had a voluntary policy. It would be much better to have a regulated policy, and I'll come on to talk to that in a moment. Here are the targets, just to show you the sort of thing. This is the uh, food standards agency 2010 target, 1.1 gram of salt uh, was the, what they had to achieve. Then it was 1 gram, now it's 0.9. And notice now we have maximum target as well. And they're all working to the same levels, and it's very important that this policy is enforced. With a voluntary policy, it's difficult, but I'll come back to that. This is a sur from surveys we did, which weren't very comprehensive, but we did have same products surveyed over many years. And you can see with the breads, this is the reduction in the salt content of bread that's occurred in the UK. And that's occurred in every product. So it's around a 25% reduction. And some products have had bigger reductions. Uh, 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 cereals, for instance, have come down by about 40%. Ready meals by 50%. So you can do this without, the public is totally unaware this has happened. If you stood outside a supermarket, somebody, mother comes out, you know, everything you've had in that basket's been reduced by salt, they'd look at you as though you were bonkers, you know, apart from one or two very well-informed uh, consumers. So it's done without awareness of the public, and almost deliberately so. There hasn't been a lot of publicity about it. These are the results that we analyzed a year or so ago of what actually happened. Here's the reduction in 24-hour urinary sodium. These were very accurately measured with dye markers. I don't want to go into the details, but they, all I can say is they're quite accurate. Here's the fall in salt intake, about a 15% reduction. Here's the reduction in population blood pressure. We've taken out people on treatment, obviously, and corrected for other factors, although most of the factors went the other way. If we didn't correct it, it, it there still was this reduction, and yet weight has gone up, various other things have gone up, which would put blood pressure up, although fruit and vegetable consumption has gone up a small amount, but most other factors have gone the same way. There's been a big reduction in uh, heart disease and strokes. Now, obviously, not all of that is due to salt reduction, because some is due to smoking and other things that have happened in the meantime. But if we look at what uh, this actually means, it means around a, about a 20,000 strokes and heart attacks a year have been prevented by this policy, roughly. And the National Institute of Clinical Excellence worked out that the cost of the SALT campaign was around £5 million a year, a lot spent on television advertising, which was a complete waste of time by the Food Standards Agency, and the healthcare saving costs were £1.5 billion. And that is amazing. You spend a pound to save 300 or one dollar, Australian dollar, to save 300 There's no other public health policy that's so cost-effective. And that's recognised by the WHO that SALT reduction is the most cost-effective public health policy that we, have, we know. And it's even more effective than tobacco, although we're, of course, not saying that we shouldn't be doing something about tobacco. Both of them are very cost-effective, in fact. This just compares from uh, Bruce, I think, from Bruce Neal's unit in, in Sydney, the salt levels in Australia via the UK. And you can see that uniformly your salt levels are higher than ours now. And this actually is a national scandal, in my view. I mean, why the hell should UK people have a lower, low, less salt?